Well, Howard, thank you very much. And what a delight it is to be speaking to this august joint assembly. There are so many brilliant think tanks on the centre-right in London, and we legislators don't have time to keep up with the works of more than one or two of them. But I always feel that I have a, a certain relationship with the CPS, under whose auspices I took my first tottering steps in politics. I published my first pamphlet uh, in their uh, interest 20 years ago, uh, and they continue still to plant the flag of debate a little bit in advance of the vanguard. And it's wonderful to see them here. It's particularly wonderful to see them here with the 1900 Club. I think it's an essential part of conservatism that we have uh, a Burkean reverence for the wisdom of uh, those who have done it before, those former parliamentarians, including my good friend Sir Clive, who can remember the foundation of this club uh, in 1906, <laughs> following that uh, liberal defeat. They haven't changed, you know, the Lib Dems. Uh, as, as they were so it's wonderful. I feel rather like a having a, a, a sort of maternal relationship with the CPS and, and this Burkean filial reverence for the 1900 Club, I feel as a child whose parents have perhaps gone a tri undergone a trial separation and are now reunited in the room. It's wonderful to have you all here. Especially after the week that I've just been having in Brussels. We are going through the commission hearing nominations. What a relief to come back to these gorgeous British surroundings after sitting through the committee hearings that we've just had. One after another, the candidates proclaiming their belief in a federal Europe, in a United States of Europe, elbowing each other aside in their keenness to show how incredibly Eurozealous they are. Our own Lord Hill proudly told his hearing yesterday that he would always put the EU interest above that of the City of London, and he went on to boast that, at least in a personal capacity, he was not a supporter of the United Kingdom's legal challenge against the cap on uh, bonuses in financial services, which I found interesting. I mean, you don't really have to be that Eurosceptic or that conservative to quirk an eyebrow at Brussels telling private companies how they may remunerate their staff. But actually, Lord Hill is probably, of course, never stood for office. Uh, uh, I don't think he's ever stood for any kind of election ever. He was a, a lobbyist. But he's actually one of the more democratic of the commission nominees. Most of the others in the classic Brussels tradition have come to the European Commission having just been rejected by their voters. Or in one case, the case of the Slovenian uh, outgoing Prime Minister, she lost the election and then just had time to appoint herself as the Slovenian Commission nominee. She's, of course, following the example of uh, Mr. Juncker, who, after 18 years of running Luxembourg, had just lost the election and been thrown out by the voters of the Grand Duchy. So don't let anybody tell you in that tired, old, Eurosceptic plate that the European Commission is undemocratic. My lords and ladies and gentlemen, it is much worse than that. Uniquely, we have contrived a system that is anti-democratic in the sense that you only get to go there when you have been expressly rejected by your voters. It's only when, like Kinnock uh, or Mandelson uh, or Patton, it's only when you've been thrown out that you are invited to come and legislate for them anyway. Now, it's easy to become depressed. I was sinking into a certain melancholia yesterday as I listened to all this bilge coming out of the mouths of the nominees. And I'd like to talk about the perils of pessimism. Because I think this is something to which conservatives are perhaps disproportionately prone. Readiness to look on the dark side. Belief that the best is past and that decline awaits us. And it's a very old sense. I discovered a, a phrase of Lord Macaulay's written in 1848 where he said, it may be true, they may be correct, who say that the best is behind us and that decline awaits. But so said every previous generation with as much apparent cause. 
and the brute facts, the hard data, are unremittingly cheerful. Most people, in most places, are living happier, healthier, more fulfilled lives than our grandparents would have imagined possible. Of course, there are occasional reverses, recessions and wars, but the general trend since mankind discovered the wonders of trade and exchange and specialization has been upwards. If you look at all the most basic measurements, longevity, literacy, infant mortality, calorie intake, height, things are getting better and are getting better at an accelerating rate and yet in every generation the publishers will always reward the author who has the most dire outlook. Now, the cause, that, that changes with fashion. That changes from generation to generation. I can remember when people were very worried about global cooling. Now they're all very worried about global warming. It could be bird flu, or it could be swine flu, or it could be drugs-resistant superbugs, or it could be asteroid strikes. It could be nuclear holocaust, it could be underpopulation or overpopulation or Islamization or the debt crisis. The cause, as I say, changes with fashion, but the underlying argument never changes. This time it's going to be different. Up until now, things have got stubbornly better and better, but this time it's going to be different. And as I say, as J.S. Uh, J. Mill observed, uh, you are always regarded as a sage when you say that terrible things are in store, and nobody ever picks you up on it and says, hang on, that didn't happen. They continue to take your next blockbusting thesis. So I would like to talk about our relationship with the European Union in a cheerful and optimistic spirit. Not only because I think that that is apt and true, but also because I think it makes tactical sense. You know, when conservatives Focus on the things they don't like. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of things not to like. Let's leave Europe aside. There's the debt crisis, there's the way our values are introduced and our patriotism is scorned, the way our children and grandchildren are being laden with these financial burdens. It's easy to get angry. It's easy to become curmudgeonly. I catch myself doing it sometimes. <laughs> but we are at our most persuasive and at our most electorally successful when, like Margaret Thatcher here, like Ronald Reagan in the US, when we imbue our message with a little hint of warmth, a little breath of optimism, a sense that the best lies ahead. Think of what happened in the recent referendum in Scotland. Look at the way in which steadily, in defiance of all predictions and models, which tell you that there is a swing to the status quo during the final two months of the campaign, look at the way Alex Salmond persistently narrowed the gap. Don't let the final outcome blind you to who won the campaign and which way the opinion polls moved. He began with a deficit of more than 20% and he closed with half of that deficit. Why? because of his relentless good cheer, both about the prospects of a yes vote and about the prospects of an independent Scotland. And whatever was thrown at him about the currency, about the EU membership, about the uh, disinvestment, it was swallowed up by that supernova of optimism that he gave off. Where on the other side, well, they were talking about all the things that would go wrong. Now, they may have had a point. I think on most of those issues, they did have a point. But even when people are convinced, they don't like to hear it like that. And that's, I think, the mistake that Eurosceptics are set to make in the analogous <coughs> referendum campaign here. It's called by some commentators the Farage paradox. The better that UKIP does in the opinion polls, the further the withdrawal list sentiment sinks. The one is purchasing its success at the expense of the other. And it's not hard to see why that is. UKIP is focusing on all the things that it doesn't like. And even when issue by issue people agree with those issues, with those questions, the general impression of anger, nostalgia, is off-putting. Let me put that in a more reductionist way. 
in a referendum campaign, if one side is talking about trade and investment, and the other side is talking about Romanians and Bulgarians, which side sounds grown up? Which side sounds convincing? So I would like, in the time that I have tonight, to make a positive, economic, democratic, constitutional, and cheerful case for how much better Britain could be doing. Free from what is the real nostalgia here, which is this 1950s vision of a European bloc. And let me put that argument in one episode, one fact. At the beginning of this year, the European Union shelved its free trade talks with India. And at the same time, EFTA, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland and Liechtenstein, announced that they expect to sign a comprehensive free trade agreement with the Republic of India by next year. Now, when we bear in mind that India grew by 4.4% last year, while the European Union shrank by 0.3%, the Eurozone shrank by 0.9%, I would say that gives those EFTA countries quite an advantage. Is there any state in this part of the world that stands to gain more from unrestricted commerce with that rising giant than the United Kingdom? India is a common law democracy. It is certainly for business purposes English speaking. It is the fourth largest investor here. It owns Tempoli, it owns Jaguar. There are 1.4 million Britons of Indian origin, and yet we cannot sign a free trade agreement with India or with anyone else because we gave that power to the European Union on the day we joined, the 1st of January, 1973. On the 1st of June, Norway and Switzerland signed, or rather uh, gave effect to, the free trade agreements that they'd earlier signed with China. China grew at 7.7% last year. The European Union, to remind you, shrank by 0.3%. Uh, the Eurozone shrank by 0.9%. My friends, we are in the wrong place. We don't sit on great natural resources in this beautiful, <coughs> damp, green island of ours. We have to make our way in the world by what we buy and sell, and that means we have to be where the customers are, and increasingly they are not in Europe. Here's a, a scary statistic. The year that we joined, 1973, Western Europe was 36% of world GDP. Today that figure is 23%. In 2020, it will be 15%. I write a blog for the Daily Telegraph, and I made a throwaway comment in it not long ago. I said, every continent on the planet is now experiencing economic growth, except Antarctica and Europe. <laughs> and a Spanish friend got in touch very closely. He sent me these reams of data, and I had to concede as I read through his figures that he was right and I was wrong. Antarctica is doing fine. <laughs> Ships are returning, and the Antarctic economy is rebounding in line with everyone else's. We are trapped in the only trade bloc on the planet that is dwindling economically. We're sundered from the hinterland to which we're connected by our history and our geography. I was born in Lima, Peru. I spent the first years of my life in the large, the then large Anglo Peru. Community. At the end of last year, I went back uh, and visited, probably for the first time since being baptized there, the Anglican Church in Lima, the Church of the Good Shepherd in Miraflores. And it was a very melancholy experience. Everyone was very nice, but the congregation was three or four people. And the nave is about the width that this room is long. It was built on its present site in 1949 to accommodate a large Anglican congregation in the days when we were still a global trading nation. The British, or the Anglo-Peruvian community into which I was born, ran the mines, the shipping, the railways, the canals, and above all, the textiles. In the 1970s, as the common external tariff was erected in phases, on every continent, 
In South America, in Asia, in Africa, we had the, the melancholy, long withdrawing war as Britain turned its back on the world and focused on this little patch of Europe. It's no place for us to be by temperament, by history, or by geography. I'd like to, in the spirit of optimism again, talk a little bit about what we could do. People, the idea has got around that people who are critical of the EU are unappeasable. We are mad, angry, uh, fanatical, zealous. Anything that David Cameron or any future British government were to bring back from Brussels would only stoke even more unreasonable demands. Let me, let me, in a constructive, helpful, and I hope optimistic spirit, suggest ten things that if I were Prime Minister, I would be looking for in terms of reforming our relationship with the European Union. The first of them is the one I've just mentioned, trade. It seems to me critical that the United Kingdom should be able to sign a bilateral FTA with Australia. Now you may say, well that, right there, you've completely ruled out any kind of relationship with the European Union, because the common external tariff is the essence of the whole thing. Actually, I'm not sure that's true. If we withdrew from the common agricultural policy, right there, you've got rid of the bulk of the common external tariff. There are large sectors to which the external tariff doesn't apply anyway. There may well be a way that we could negotiate, for example, that new technologies, new sectors, those which are not covered by existing EU trade policy, would not be automatically drawn into it, but would remain <coughs> national prerogatives. The EU-controlled bit would then be swallowed up by the natural growth of the private sector. It'd be left like one of those temples in the jungle with the undergrowth smashing its way through the flags. The most important thing, we are the only country in Europe that exports more outside the EU than to the EU. We're the only one. We are therefore uniquely penalised <coughs> by the common external tariff. Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, they are all members of the single market. They're all covered by free movement of goods and services and capital and with some restrictions in the case of Switzerland people. But they critically are able to sign free trade accords with third countries. I don't believe that we wouldn't be able to do the same. And when you bear in mind that Norway, per capita, sells two and a half times as much to the EU as we do, that Switzerland sells four and a half times as much from the outside, I don't believe it would prejudice our exports to Europe. Second thing, implied by the first thing, a British agricultural policy. If I were to sit here and try and invent the most wasteful, <coughs> corrupt, expensive, immoral, bureaucratic system of farm support that I could think of, I would not come close to the common agricultural policy, which penalizes us over and over again as consumers, as taxpayers, and particularly hits the United Kingdom. We are a net food importer with a relatively efficient farming sector. We're clobbered both ways. We pay more into the system and take less out of it. Now, there is an argument to be had, a philosophical argument to be had about whether you should subsidize farmers, whether you should recognize the contribution that landowners make in terms of the stewardship of our countryside. If you decided that your priority was to make our farmers better off, then simply by not rooting the money through Brussels anymore, simply by giving a direct grant based on acreage or land quality, you could increase the income of every farmer in Britain and still see lower food prices and lower taxes because we would no longer be paying the bulk of our money to subsidize their rights across the channel. Third thing, common fisheries policy. Okay. The United Kingdom has 60% of the fish stocks in the North Sea. But under CFP rules, we have a quota that is equivalent to 25% by volume or 15% by value. Although, of course, that's now becoming rather arbitrary because there are no longer any fish. This is the tragedy of the commons, something that I hope I don't need to explain to a conservative audience. It's the ancient wisdom of Aristotle, that which nobody owns, nobody will care for. As soon as you define fish stocks as a common resource to which all member states have equal access, you get what we've had, a race to hoover up such stocks that are there without any incentive to treat it as a renewable resource. 
every other country that has ownership of its waters, Iceland, Norway, the Falkland Islands, New Zealand, has come up with schemes to make skippers have a stake in growing the resource. You can't do that if the waters are jointly owned. Fourth thing, foreign policy. We're a member of the UN Security Council. We're the fourth military power. Why, why do we need to be rooting our foreign policy through Baroness Ashton or now this Italian lady? Are we not capable of having diplomatic representation without needing to, pick, to be part of a, a wider European common foreign and security policy, without needing to have these blue and gold flags on all our embassies? I mean, if we're not capable of doing this, who is? <laughs> How does Jamaica manage? <laughs> or, or, or South Africa? What an extraordinary thing that we, of all countries, think we're not able to have influence in the world independently. I mean, the risk of stating the obvious you have more influence when you have your own foreign policy. Norway has a population of four million. Look at how active Norwegian diplomats are around the world. They negotiated the partition in the Sudan. They're active in the peace talks in Sri Lanka, in Southeast Asia, obviously in the Israel-Palestine, the Oslo uh, Corps. <laughs> They're able to do all of those things with less than a tenth of our population because they have their own foreign policy. Extraordinary that that should need to be stated. And yet, as with all of these things, and you'll see a theme here in a moment, the British government at the moment is not even requesting it. And the contrary is going in the other direction. EU citizenship. How many of us are really enriched by being citizens of the European Union? Something that we were uh, turned into overnight in 1992. You remember Norman Tebbit's great speech at the 1992 party conference? The last time we had a party conference in Brighton. Do you want to be citizens of the European Union? From that common citizenship stem most of the things that have caused most of the popular discontent with the EU now. Reciprocal voting rights, reciprocal residence rights, and reciprocal welfare claims. There's no point in trying to nibble at the edges of those things. You should come straight to the root cause and say that we are UK citizens with one nationality and any bilateral agreements that we choose to enter into with neighboring countries or with any other countries around the world on reciprocal entitlement to health care or social security or pensions will be done voluntarily and by agreement, not by dictat of a European court. Which brings me on to number six, which come, follows on from uh, citizenship, which is the symbols that go with it. The European Union is acquiring one by one the attributes and trappings of statehood. Passport, driver's license, national anthem, flag, national day, national slogan. Do you know, we are now expected to stand to attention in the European Parliament when they play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, I don't know whether you've read or seen the film of A Clockwork Orange, but it has the same effect on me now as it has on poor Alex, and for the same reason, which is bad connotations. And, uh, uh, disgraceful connotations to a sublime piece of music. I want to shout with him, but poor old Ludwig van only wrote music and didn't deserve this. Isn't that the lowest of low-hanging fruit for a British government to bring back? <clears throat> Scrapping of the symbols and, uh, 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 and trappings that annoy so many people and that really would cost us nothing. And yet it's not on the agenda. The, the Foreign Office isn't even considering it. Now a big one. Fiscal autonomy. Oh, in mode now when we talk about Scottish devolution. What about some fiscal autonomy for the UK? In other words, no financial transactions tax, no EU carbon taxes or other green taxes, and let's not stop there. Why do we allow the European Union to dictate levels of indirect taxation? Shouldn't we be having tax competition? Shouldn't we be uh, encouraging jurisdictional competition and thereby downward pressure on rates. Harmonized taxes, which is the big idea in Brussels at the moment, is a way for uncompetitive countries to get out of having to make the domestic reforms that they don't dare put to their publics by exporting their costs to their rivals. It is why Europe is now, unlike even Antarctica, the only shrinking continent. If the rest of the EU is determined to maim itself in this fashion, I don't see why Britain should uh, feel obliged to follow suit. 
Criminal justice. This is uh, eighth on my list of ten. Again, something that was introduced at Maastricht. We could survive perfectly well before that. Why are we part of the... Uh, well, it's a wonderfully Orwellian title that they, they give it. It was invented in 98. Uh, something called the Area of Freedom, Security and Justice. And what that means is what they describe in Brussels as a common judicial space, like a single market for law. Fairly major issue if you are one of the two common law countries in the European Union, where, as so often, the odd ones out. We're the ones who have to change more than anybody else in order to accommodate the new me. There's a pan-European magistracy being created. You probably haven't heard of this, but welcome to my world, called Eurojust. It's a, a, embryonic European police force called Europol. But this is not just a theoretical problem. You'll have all seen what happened to my constituents, the King family, the family who took their little boy out of Southampton Hospital and committed the appalling offence of suggesting that there might be better treatment from the British NHS can offer you. I, as I said, they're constituents of mine. I came in the next morning and I said to my, uh, myself, this is all we're going to do today. This is a, a shocking uh, a, a case, and it's a, a, a remediable injustice. You know, I want you to get onto the CPS, I want you to get onto the police. We saw British bureaucracy at its worst there, but the one lot of people who I cannot criticize are the Spanish authorities, who were incredibly helpful, incredibly apologetic. One of them said to me, one of the, the people in the uh, Justice Department who was in charge of that case in Malaga said, Senor Diputado, you know, we're Spanish, we love children. Can you imagine us wanting to separate this five-year-old from his mother when he hasn't been apart from this since the day he fell ill? He said, you have to understand, it's the European arrest warrant. It's the most powerful vehicle in the judicial arsenal. It was intended as an anti-terrorist measure. We don't have any discretion beyond the discretion of checking that the person is the one named on the, on the document. That's as, as far as we have any leeway. Think about that. It's, it's in a way sort of inevitable part of human nature, isn't it? It may have been intended as an anti-terrorist measure, but if you put that power into the hands of the police and the hands of the CPS, people being what people are, they will start using it routinely as indeed they have. And this is, by the way, not the first time that a life of a constituent of mine has been wrecked <coughs> by this wretched uh, device. Another constituent of mine, a couple of years ago, was celebrating his A-levels in Greece. There was a fracas in a nightclub which he was nowhere near. It was a case of very obvious mistaken identity. A boy was killed. The case against my constituent was so obviously based on fabricated statements. Everyone knew that it would be thrown out within five minutes of it coming to court, as indeed it was. In the meantime, this boy had spent nearly three years in Athens under house arrest, 11 months of them in one of the nastiest prisons in Europe, waiting for his case to come to trial. You think of the rows we had in this country about 42-day detention, and yet at the same time, we're allowing this to happen under the European arrest warrant. When he finally got home, the people with whom he had been celebrating his A-levels were celebrating their graduation. And how do you give that back to a boy of that age? This is the reality. It is incredible to me and shameful that at the moment, after the European elections, when the Conservative Party is swanking about how tough it's going to get in Europe, the Home Secretary is opting back in to the European arrest warrant from which we had previously opted out. It is absolutely inexplicable. Well, actually, the explanation is the police want it. Of course the police want it. I mean, a country where you automatically do whatever the police want is the definition of a police state, isn't it? We are, the whole point of having you parliamentarians is precisely that we're a civilian country and we don't just do what the security services tell us. Two more in my list of ten. And this one I'll mention just because it's a, a, a neat example of how we have diluted what was previously our position. When he stood for the leadership of the Conservative Party, David Cameron said he wanted to repatriate all social and employment policy from Brussels. And remarkable as this may seem, Nick Clegg had actually said something similar. When he was named he said, this is a, a good example of where Brussels is overreached. Even I, as a great pro-European, think that it is bad and anti-competitive for employment law and social policy to be set at EU level. So, 
the policy found its way into both manifestos and indeed into the coalition agreement. But it's now been dropped. And it's now been dropped because, frankly, and I'll come on to this in a moment, everything has been dropped that might require a treaty change. Number 10, last one, but I think this is the biggest. Supremacy of British law on British soil. To put that in a technical sense, reforming sections two and three of the 1972 European Communities Act so that EU law would no longer have automatic primacy in British courts, so that EU directives and regulations would be treated as advisory pending an implementing decision by Parliament. Again, people will say, oh, that means leaving the EU. You know, this, this doctrine of direct effect was not written into the treaties. It was invented by the European Court of Justice in the 1960s in a series of uh, power grabs of examples of flagrant judicial activism where they awarded themselves in a kind of judicial coup d'etat powers that the national governments had never agreed to give. I don't believe that the whole European Union would stop working if you recognize the supremacy of national legal systems, which, by the way, every country with a written constitution does in its own constitution. We uniquely have no such protection. So those, just to recap, those would be the 10 things that I would go in looking for. Independent trade policy, no CAP, no CFP, independent diplomatic and foreign policy, British rather than EU citizenship, an end to the symbols and trappings, fiscal autonomy, common law, not EU law, uh, repatriation of social and employment policy, and supremacy of the House of Commons. But I don't want to be unreasonable about this. You know, maybe we could get some of them and not others. If pushed, I would say that the two most important are trade and parliamentary supremacy. But it may be that, you know, on that list of ten, we could get six of them or three of them. At present, HMG is not pushing for any of them. And it's really the one point I wanted to leave with you, because in the whole European debate, this is the area where there is the biggest mismatch between what has been said officially and on the record and what the public seems to have understood. People keep saying, you know, clever, respectable commentators keep saying, well, we'll have to see if the PM is able to bring anything back and we'll have to see when he shows his hand and so on. In March, David Cameron wrote an article in the Sunday Telegraph in which he set out what our negotiating position would be. He set out these seven aims of things he intended to bring back. I mean, the, the, the essence of the being that none of them required a treaty change. None of them really, all of them could be proclaimed to have been fulfilled virtually now. One or two of them actually went further. One or two of them, you know, under the rubric of completing the single market, we, we actually mean giving Brussels more power. Well, that's, that's an easy sell in Brussels, believe me. But of the, the only one that I think might require some uh, written acknowledgement is an opt-out for Britain from ever closer union. Not a treaty change, just a sort of coda saying that it doesn't apply to Britain. Well, surprise, surprise, as soon as that list had been published, Ken Clark popped up on television and said, yes, I heartily endorse all of these things. Wonderful, because they don't change anything. And the Deputy Prime Minister then said exactly the same thing. He was on the Mar program. What about this... Uh, these things that David Cameron wants to bring up. Oh yes, he said, I'm very, very happy with those. We worked on it together, you know, because they don't really uh, alter our status in Europe. And yet, bizarrely, this doesn't seem to have sunk in at all, even among very political people, including possibly one or two of the brilliant people in this room. And people are still saying, well, let's wait and see what he brings back. I can guarantee that on the basis of those seven proclaimed aims, any British government will be able to come back and declare victory. And I will further guarantee that it will be done with lots of choreography from the other European leaders to make out that it was a bigger thing than it really was. You can be certain that Angela Merkel will, like some character in one of those commando comics, say, ah, they have been completely outflanked by the Englanders, they have got <laughs> And no doubt some of our Christianist journalists will write it up that way. But the reality is, is there an intergovernmental conflict? Does there need to be a parliamentary ratification in the other 27 countries? Because if not, nothing has changed. 
<coughs> nothing of any significance. And this is the point I want to make. We are wasting a generational opportunity to make that change. We could have got, if we'd applied some of the criteria that I was talking about, we could have established the precedent of having a different kind of status. Some kind of associate membership or country club membership or whatever you want to call it, but established the precedent that Britain could be in the single market but outside most of the political institutions. And had we done that, I can assure you that a number of the other member states would have queued up to ask for a similar deal. But we could have had an altogether more comfortable and flexible Europe, where you could have had a pan-continental market stretching from Iceland to Armenia, you know, from the Faroe Islands to Georgia, with maybe 40, 45 countries, all bound by the four freedoms of goods, services, people, and capital, within which then, yeah, sure, you would have your group of 20, 25, however many federalist countries, which could go ahead and have their common army and their common police force and their president of Europe, or whatever else. Wouldn't that leave everybody happier? Wouldn't that take the tensions out of the current talks in Brussels? Everyone would be better off. We'd have got what we thought we came for. Common market, not political union. And the federalist countries, well, to borrow from Alex Salmond, they would have lost a bad tenant and gained a good neighbor. But that opportunity, sadly, is not, oh well, it's not lost. But the only way to get it, it's now clear, is to vote to leave. I don't see any other route to achieving any repatriation of power other than by leaving and striking such a bargain from the outside as the Swiss do. I opened with a um, reference to the Scottish referendum. Let me close with a similar one. In every poll prior to the beginning of the formal referendum campaign north of the border, huge majorities of Scots said that they preferred something in between independence and the status quo. When it was put to them as a binary choice, yes, they preferred the status quo. But when they were given the Devo Max option, the idea of full autonomy that would stop short of formal separation, some 80% of voters said that they preferred that option. Now, here's the thing. I think that is a similar lineup when it comes to the issue of the EU. Most people in Britain will say, I do not want the status quo. I want a free trading relationship with Europe. I don't want to, uh, to pull up the drawbridge either. I want to have a common market, close intergovernmental cooperation, but not provincial status within the United States of Europe. I think that, when it's uh, put in those terms, attracts a similar high percentage. But the critical difference is this. David Cameron, as Prime Minister, was able to say in Scotland, if you vote no, then as PM of the United Kingdom, I will immediately come forward with a new package of devolution. By the way, in his defense, he didn't do this in a panicky response to the opinion polls. He had said this in response to the Strathclyde Commission back at the end of May, when the no side was still comfortably ahead. Again, an uh, uh, example of how our press often missed the point. But in the case of Europe, there's no way that we can achieve those things. There's no way that, because they're not even being asked for. And so the only opportunity to get that Devo Max option in Europe is to do it in the way that the EFTA countries do. To do it through bilateral treaty, regulated by the small, loose, effective EFTA regulatory authorities that apply to the whole continent outside the political union. And I'll say this again. Let's do it optimistically. Don't let anyone tell you that we're somehow too small to survive, that we're too small to make a go of it. What are the richest countries in Europe? Or, correction, what are the countries with the richest people in Europe? The highest per capita GDP? Norway and Switzerland. The EU, uh, sorry, the United Nations ranks them respectively first and second as the best places in the world to be born. Australia is third. Now, ask yourselves, are we really not capable as a global people, a maritime island people, of thriving as a global power. 
If 7 million Swiss, if 4 million Norwegians, if 320,000 Icelanders, if 18,000 Liechtensteiners relying on a series of bilateral free trade agreements are able to furnish their peoples with the highest standard of living in Europe, how much more can we? A nation of 64 millions of people whose enterprising energies have touched every continent. I always remember that, that wonderful scene in Skyfall, the, the last of the Bond movies, where Judy Dench quotes Tennyson, uh, quotes Tennyson's Ulysses. She applies it to our present position as a people. Though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the, the sixth largest economy in the world, but we are scheduled to overtake France and become the fifth largest. Bring on the Germans. We are the fourth military power on the planet. We're one of five permanent seat holders on the UN Security Council. Our language is the most widely spoken by the human race. How much bigger do we have to be before we're able to run our own affairs in our own interests, trading with our friends and allies in Europe, but governing us? Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. Dan, thank you for a wonderful speech. I uh, do hope CPS will be publishing it, and I can't but think that the great majority of citizens, had they been here to hear it, would completely agree with what you had to say. And I still find it uh, strange that our party doesn't actually understand the views of its grassroots supporters. Um, some questions, please. Sir. We give you a little brief prepared by the taxpayers of that yeah. shows that the cost of being under European regulations for 100 billion pounds in the last 15 years. Um, I was a special advisor to 10 education secretaries and I used to travel around Europe and I went to the German education department. So I was interested in their rail shoes and mm. their apprenticeships. I said, well, what do you do about the European Youth Employment Laws? To my amazement, I was told, the Germans have a constitutional court. If they don't like, if one of their landers, 17 landers, don't like the European rule, they say, no, thank you. Well, if the Germans have it, why don't we have it? Uh, so that's the first point. There's an election there. We will lose if we don't get back 15% of people say they're going to vote for UKIP. The only way we're going to get those back is if we have the sort of policy which is recommended. And can't we persuade the Prime Minister, who gave a very good speech yesterday, that uh, we have to have a much clearer European Union policy. And to say, oh, we're going to have a referendum in two years once we've got all these reforms most people won't believe we'll get the reforms and they'll probably still vote UKIP. So let's take a much stronger view before the general election, otherwise we, we probably will not win a majority. Yeah, yeah. About the election, if I may, I'm, I'm actually perfectly satisfied with the PM's policy. It's not the way I would have written it, but it remains an unarguable fact that the only route to a referendum is with a majority in the House of Commons who will vote for it. I mean, that, that is a statement of the obvious. What an irony of cosmic proportions it would be if the reason that no such majority came about was because of UKIP. If, whatever the purity of their intentions, the result of UKIP candidates was to split the vote and create, on a minority of the share of the vote, a Labour government. And by the way, this is not a, uh, an abstract possibility. Uh, 
in the room tonight is a friend of mine from Canada who will well remember what happened in the early 90s there. There was a Canadian type UKIP, Preston Manning's Reform Party, which burst out of the prairies, challenged the, prog the old Progressive Conservative Party in every constituency. A party doesn't go from government to two MPs for one reason alone, but this was a big part of it. It was a big factor under the first past the post system that they had in the Canadian writings that we have here, you are brutally punished if there is a split on one side of the spectrum. And we had 10 years of liberal governments in Canada with a fairly low share of the popular vote. For four of those years, the official opposition, the party with the highest number of seats in the Canadian House of Commons, was the Quebec Separatist Party on 13 point something percent. That's how badly first past the post hits a split of this kind. If you don't think it could happen here, look at Eastwick. Two right of centre candidates standing on virtually identical platforms, both anti EU, both pro tax cuts, both pro immigration controls. Two ladies between them, one for the Conservative Party and one for UKIP, secured 53% of the vote and both lost. The Liberals took the seat with 32% of the vote. Now imagine that being replicated in a few more places, and you have the very horrible but very real prospect of Miliband on what, 36%? support becoming Prime Minister with a working majority. And that's, that, for me, it's not about policy. It's about finding some electoral understanding, at least in the key marginal seats. We're talking about a relatively small number of seats where this matters, which would prevent Eurosceptic votes being fractured in such a way as to put a Euro fanatical government in on a minority. Roger Kendrick, I've just come back from three and four days in Birmingham and, then, and I went to a lot of European fringe meetings and there's a huge range of views uh, out there amongst our own politicians. And one of the things that we keep coming back to is getting control of the future. And where we lost it, um, well we progressively lost it through the Commission and we progressively lost it through the judgments of the European Court of Justice which uh, judges on, on the spirit rather than the letter of the law. But the one thing David Cameron has said unequivocally is that we're not going to have ever closer union. And as you've already pointed out, to stop that happening in the way that everything else has happened to us, we have to get supremacy for the uh, Parliament in London. If we could get that, couldn't we put, sort the rest of it out in due course? And my second question is, would you be prepared to stand as the leader of the No campaign? Well, let, let, let's worry about getting the, the referendum first. I think we need to focus on that. And as I say, that's, that's not going to happen if we have Miliband. He's made that very clear. Of course, you're right. We could simply declare supremacy and say to the other member states, what are you going to do about it? We are a very, uh, the day that we left the European Union, we've become overwhelmingly the EU's largest market bigger than their second and third biggest markets put together, which are the US and Japan. We have a huge trade deficit with the EU, but a surplus with the rest of the world. Now, it's not novel. <coughs> see on this list and see around the room some very distinguished uh, industrialists and, and financiers. All of you who have been active in business will know better than I do that it's not normal for the salesman to bully or threaten the customer. In these negotiations, we are the customers. We have a very strong position, if only we would use it. But the trouble is, we don't want to. I'll tell you what I've learned in 15 years as an MEP, the thing that I've really picked up. The biggest obstacle to this kind of deal, biggest obstacle to a different status for Britain that would leave us with a kind of common market plus or EFTA plus arrangement, is not the other member governments. It's our own officials. Sir Humphrey is haunted by the fear of not being invited, of a decision happening in a room, or indeed just a smart cocktail happening, a party happening in a room, without his participation. Because being a human being, Sir Humphrey tends to conflate his presence with the national interest. And I've learned over the years, first of all, that they are two different things. Sir Humphrey is not always a very good judge. And secondly, that he's brilliant at outsmarting his political bosses. The library next to this is a copy of Hugo Young's brilliant book, This Blessed Plot, which is a terrifying account 
of how the FCO, throughout the 60s and 70s, kept a policy of common market application and membership on track, sometimes in defiance of the explicit stated wishes of their elected bosses, because they regarded it as a higher national goal. Amazingly, they were boasting about it. He tracked down the diplomats to retirement in the south of France, and they were all quite open about how they had done it. And that's the reality. Pache, any diplomats here, by the way, is nothing personal. My mother was one of you. Uh, I had a lot of time for her, obviously. But I have seen this over and over again. You know, it's, it's like that, that old joke about the tourist on white wall saying to the copper, at which side is the foreign office on? And the copper said, well, that's a very good question. So, so I tell you that story mainly because it's nice to have a copper outside Downing Street being polite to the bidding. Um, but, but, and so this is the, the, the fundamental problem we have. We are not asking for any of these things. And until we have a different uh, exertion of our national will, none of it will happen. And the other member countries can hardly be blamed. They'll say, well, what, you know, what do you expect? You signed up to all this? Go for it. Um, Kat, Daniel, Daniel um, just say what? Do you want to speak? Yes. Very quickly. Um, isn't the fundamental problem that actually we have a prime minister who is going to lead the no campaign? Um, the, whatever it is, the stay in, stay in EU campaign. Uh, without somebody who is actually leading from the front uh, the get out of, out of the EU campaign, we're going to lose the referendum. I, I disagree. I have a much higher faith in my fellow countrymen, a much higher regard for their critical faculties than that. Think again of what just happened in Scotland. To remind you, they closed by half a 20-point deficit. Now, Alex Salmond, excuse me, had only one advantage over an independence campaign UK-wide, which was that he was the Prime Minister and had revealed a sort of modicum of, of experience and competence in government. All the other differences between the two campaigns, it seems to me, would favour the British independence campaign over the Scottish <laughs> There'd be a much more balanced spread of newspapers, I suspect. There was only one paper that was for the, uh, for the yes side in Scotland. There would be a much more balanced spread of political opinion. Think how much stronger Alex Salmond's campaign would have been had there been a handful of Labour MSPs, maybe one or two Conservatives, who'd come out and joined him. A real lesson for us here. The SNP gathered all of the supporters of Scottish independence into one political party that could then be caricatured and dismissed. If UKIP were to do the same here, the effect on the eventual campaign would be ruinous. But I suspect that when the moment comes, there will be probably a majority of Conservatives and a good chunk of Labour people who will be arguing to come out. Business will be much more evenly split. There were very, very few financiers or industrialists in Scotland arguing for separation. There are plenty in Britain who are now arguing for a different deal, but who, if no deal is on offer, I suspect uh, will come, uh, will argue for, for global markets. Putting everything together, I don't think British voters will fall again, as they did in 1975, for this trick of a, a, a bogus renegotiation. I think if we're offered continued membership of the EU which we've had 40 years to get used to. I think we can trust people to make the right decision. To come back, Scots, you know, Salmon began 20 points behind and finished 10 points behind. We are starting level pegging. I'm optimistic. Yes, Dan, can you reassure us that you're not going to join UK? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I keep going on the record about this. So I, I've said so on television. I, on Twitter, on my blog, um, and in meetings, yes. Dan, the um, development you mentioned regarding a, a possible deal or something in the marginal seats, the election is May 7th next year, it's closing in, we have the Clapton by election next Thursday with Hayward and Middleton up in the northwest which I'm told is close. If UKIP win those seats, 
I fear that any kind of deal is off the table because they will argue you vote UKIP, you get UKIP. And also Grant Shapps has rather stupidly, in my opinion, ruled out any kind of deal. So realistically, what is possible? I mean, I, you know, this is a, it can be decided at a much higher level than mine. I, I'm only talking as a civilian, giving you my own point of view here. I'm not part of any, any discussions. But uh, UKIP have repeatedly signaled that they are open to a discussion on this. And for whatever reason, we have not lifted a telephone to them. I don't know why. Uh, but I think that, you know, what we're talking, there are 650 constituencies. In 580 of those, it would make no difference. Probably in 620 of them, it would make no difference. But in a few of them, it would, and it would appreciably make a difference. So we're talking about a, a tiny number of seats where it would be demonstrably the case that either a Conservative or UKIP candidate has a chance of winning, and that the withdrawal of the other would overwhelmingly help that candidate. You know, if, if we were all calculating machines, if we were all androids or Vulcans, we would have done this deal. The reason we haven't is because we're human and, and personal rivalries get in the way and inertia kicks in and uh, candidates are selected and they've started spending money and they don't want to withdraw and all of that. But wouldn't it reflect badly on everyone involved if Labour were to come in what was it the, 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 the great historian said of the returning Bourbons? They've, they've learnt nothing and forgotten nothing. Um, obviously, they've learnt nothing. I can't really say they've forgotten nothing, because obviously Miliband pointedly did forget the deficit. <laughs> but if, they were, if they were to come back in unapologetically with the same policies of tax and spend and borrow, void our treasury, exhaust our credit, cancel the welfare and education reforms, all because pride got in the way of making a sensible deal in a tiny number of marginal seats, wouldn't that reflect badly on all of us? This is not a game for heaven's sake. We're talking about the economic success of the country. Would you recommend a possibility of a coalition with UKIP bearing in mind what you've said? Yes. You would. Uh, I mean, I'm quite, quite baffled why you are not in UKIP because there is no possibility whatsoever of your views becoming official conservative party policy. So... But here's the odd thing. According to all the surveys, 78% of party members would vote to leave the European Union tomorrow. And more important, a majority of conservative voters, a smaller majority, but still a clear majority, would vote if there were a referendum tomorrow to leave the European Union. So when People often make this point to me a lot less politely than you just did. You know, uh, why don't you push off and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and indeed, UKIPers often make the point to me. Why are you staying with that pro-EU party? The answer is, it's not a pro-EU party. Why should the majority leave to accommodate the minority? And in any case, the issue is ultimately going to be settled by a referendum either way. You know, not by one faction or another of the Conservative Party. And I come back to this point. I cannot see a way of getting out of the EU other than through a referendum, and I cannot see a way of getting a referendum other than with David Cameron in Downing Street. If somebody in the audience has got a better plan than that, I'm all ears, but I, I have yet to come across one, and that's why it seems to me it would be paradoxical, perverse, extraordinary to walk out when we're on the verge of getting this policy in, you know, after years when it was unthinkable that the Conservative Party would have adopted an in-out referendum. It would be bizarre to walk out just as the policy has become official. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. I, I am a diplomat. We have not only her Majesty's uh, Foreign Service, but I come from Cyprus. Uh, I'm here as a... Thank you. I am a diplomat. Not in Her Majesty's Foreign Service. I'm a High Commissioner of Cyprus right next door, member of the Commonwealth. At some point, I would like to hear some things about the Commonwealth as well. Uh, sympathetic observer, seeing a country that is basically split, I'm a little bit confused as to really mirroring a situation to headquarters. Two things, please. Explain to me why the city is in favor of the United Kingdom staying 
in the European Union. And it makes a difference how a referendum is phrased. You want to be in, you want to be out. Let's assume there is an out, there is an out uh, outcome of that. And it's a, it's a purely democratic process. Would that trigger another Scottish referendum? If we have, uh, uh, given the fact that they they want to be uh, in Europe, in the EU, and, and would that, do you think is going to happen? I mean, would that have a, a trickle effect? Thank you. Uh, there, are, there is a weight of city opinion in this room, uh, and I will pass that part of your question over, if I may, to our chairman, who has a, a career of experience in financial services. But if I may just touch on the other part of your question. First of all, the Commonwealth, which really is headquartered right next door, literally right next door. A great moment happened in May of this year. The Commonwealth economy overtook the Eurozone economy. The idea that common law, English-speaking links are nostalgic or sentimental or backward-looking takes no uh, regard for the way in which economic trends are happening in the world. And, uh, you know, the, the distance has never mattered less. When we joined the EU in the early 70s, you could just about make a claim that geographical proximity was important. But now, you know, it's as easy online to sell to a company in Dunedin in New Zealand as to Dunkirk. In fact, it's easier because the Dunedin company is English-speaking, common law, it has the same accountancy systems, the same unwritten business codes, it has, if there's a dispute, it'll be arbitrated in a way that both parties are happy with. None of those things is true of the company in Dunkirk, despite 40 years of single market regulation. So it is bizarre, in a way, that we're trapped in a, in a regional customs union at the moment when technology has rendered distance ineffective. Another way of putting that is, if we were not in the European Union now, would anyone in Britain be arguing that we should join it? Now, if, 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 suppose, for the sake of argument, that we had done what the Swiss had the wisdom to do in the early 70s and had a, a free trade only deal. Can anyone imagine either the Labour or Conservative parties saying we'd be better off becoming members of it? You know, why, why are we then in it? What Milton Friedman calls the tyranny of the status quo. She doesn't just mean that people are change averse, although we are. He means that huge bureaucracies grow up around whatever happens to be the existing dispensation. Every charity, every NGO, every large corporation, every municipality has a group of Europe officers. And for them, this is a question of school fees and mortgages. It's, a, it's a, not, a, not an abstract question about sovereignty. Um, on the Scottish referendum, be up to the Scottish government to trigger another Scottish referendum, but I don't see it happening. Uh, the uh, Canadian referendum ended with a much, much closer result, 50.6 to 49.4, and everyone said, oh, there's going to be another, you know, 20 years on, it's disappeared, and it's disappeared as an issue because there was substantial devolution throughout Canada, not just uh, in, in uh, Quebec. Um, but on the on the city, I'm, I'm not sure that I accept your picture, but I'll pass over to our Lord Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I, I deny strongly that the city is an aggregate pro-EU. You have the situation where one or two large firms like Goldman Sachs, and supported by the city corporation, which whose leaders and people are uh, extraordinarily pro-EU, they're in the sort of, um, you know, there'll be 300,000 job loss category. But the great majority of the city, and remember 70% of the city's business is not with Europe at all, it's with other parts of the world, so it's 70-30 basically, uh, struggle to get on with their business, to cope with all the regulations, and really uh, are not consulted, are not uh, at all uh, on the field uh, of the whole EU debate. It's, it's just been taken by a few big fish. In some ways, I'd like financial transaction tax to happen because if it did, it would be such a nightmare for the city. It would be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, and I think you would then see, rather than people just getting on with all the never-ending burden of regulation, you would see open re revolt. Uh, but again, of all the individuals that work in the city, my, my view is about 70% of those people are, are anti-EU. Do you want to do a round of questions? Yes, I, I think, yes, let's have, let's have three or four questions 
First of all, you sew in the middle there. Yes. Archie Hamilton, um, when the country voted in 1975 to stay in the EU, um, at that stage Britain was the poor man of Europe. We were doing extremely badly on almost every front, and Europe was doing rather well. Um, if we come to vote in 17 on in or out, it'll be the eighth year of stagnation in the Eurozone, um, with very, very high levels of unemployment, and those roles will be reversed. Does uh, Daniel not think that will be a very significant factor yeah, as the way people yeah. vote at that time? Yeah, yeah. Then, gentlemen behind there. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Rory Brookfield from the Freedom Association. Um, the Swiss listened to Churchill. Why didn't we, and can we change the mindset of the people who led us into this mess? Establishment. Thank you. There was another one there. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yes. I think I can make myself heard. Uh, as, uh, yes, there's the microphone. Right, okay. Dan, can I say, as somebody who's been a Eurosceptic for all the 39 years I was in Parliament, I have found your arguments and your analysis to be overwhelming compelling. Brilliant question, thank you. Can I say to you, or ask you, what is your relationship with the Prime Minister? Because I believe you should be, in addition to your MEP job, you should be an advisor to 10 Downing Street on a subject that is going, I think, to have a major impact upon the next election. Thank you for your kind words, Nick, and uh, feel free to make that suggestion to 10 Downing Street. Um, as, as yet, I can't claim any, any role in it. Although the PM does read my blog. I know this because I've twice, well, he does it, he does it, I'm, uh, all fellow politicians, you'll recognize it, and so will you. He twice has said to me, oh, I've been reading your blog. And on both occasions, I tried to catch him up by saying, what did you think of, and he knew on both occasions. So I, it, wasn't the, it wasn't just the politics. So I, I communicate with him through the airwaves, if not privately. Um, I think Archie Hamilton's point was absolutely spot on. And it exactly ties in with what I was saying about the importance of optimism. The EU, for country after country, has been joined as a product of despair. Almost every country that went into it did so because of what was seen as a failure of its national institutions. It took different forms. You know, the Italians didn't like their leaders, the Germans didn't like their history, and so on and so on. I, mean, I, I watched how in Iceland, immediately after the financial collapse there, there was a tiny spike for the first time ever. There was a majority for going into the EU, and as soon as the sunshine came back, because it gets pretty dark in Iceland in winter, the, uh, the, the mood changed because people could see that they were perfectly capable of surviving outside. Now, as you rightly say, we joined at our nadir. You know, 1973, and then 1975, the referendum. No. This was the era of the three-day week, of prices and incomes policies. Trade union barons were bigger household names than, right, double-digit inflation. You know, it felt as if we were finished as a country. When I say it was our nadir, I don't mean it was our nadir post-war. I, I cannot think of a worse moment in British history than the Heath Wilson years, since the Norman Conquest at any rate. It, it is, uh, it, it, and, and you have to ask yourselves, would we have, would a referendum on common market membership have gone the same way had it been conducted either 10 years earlier or 10 years later? Would the necessary pessimism have been there? And Archie is quite right, things have now switched around. It is impossible to persuade people that we're finished as a country, that we have to hitch our wagon to this locomotive. It's clear that far from having hitched our wagon to a, a, a locomotive, we shackled ourselves to a corpse. We joined the only bit of the world that was shrinking. And in fact, we, we, we couldn't have got our timing worse. When we went in, if you looked at the period from 1945 to 1973, Europe had, had grown spectacularly after the war. You know, it'd be, it was the years of the Wirtschaftswunder, it was the... Uh, and, and we can see all sorts of reasons, in retrospect, why that happened. Migration and bouncing back from the false low of the, 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 the degradation of infrastructure from the, the Second World War in 1945. We couldn't have timed this more badly. Europe grew spectacularly. 
We joined in 1973. It stopped growing with the oil shock in 1974 and basically hasn't grown since. We, we could not have climbed this worse uh, in retrospect. And we turned our back on the Commonwealth just as it was beginning a takeoff that lasts to this day. Rory Broomfield asks about the Swiss listening to Churchill. I think what Rory has in mind is the speech that Churchill made in Zurich in 1946. A speech that is quoted fondly by Euro fanatics because it is the speech where he says, I will say something that will astonish you, there should be a United States of Europe. He uses that phrase, United States of Europe. But they never quote what he said immediately afterwards. He went on to make very clear that Britain would not be part of it, that we would look on as a friend and sponsor, but that we and the United States, and in due course he dared to dream even the Soviet Union might look on as uh, external allies, as flying buttresses supporting the structure without joining it. And as you say, that's pretty much what the Swiss did. They said, okay, this is a good idea. Let's, you know, we're always keen to, to have good relations and friendly alliances and trade. And they did, and it's done incredibly well as a result. You know, Switzerland is the only European country that came through the crash without a downturn, which is more remarkable than you might at first think when you bear in mind that it was a banking crisis. You might have expected Switzerland to be fairly exposed. But one of the reasons why Switzerland came through so well is because it has a global trade and investment portfolio. It hasn't put all its eggs in the European basket. If that works for Switzerland, which sells 67% of its total exports to the EU, and which is completely surrounded by EU territory, how much truer would it be for us, an island country that sells only 48% of our exports, even on the raw data, to the EU, less when you bear in mind uh, the Rotterdam and Antwerp effect, which Ronald Stewart Brown has been a great uh, expert on, how much more prosperous could we be in that situation? Churchill was very clear about our role, and it's worth quoting exactly what he said to counteract all the people who quote the United States of Europe, and he said we would always choose the open sea over the continent, and he said we have our own dream and our own task. We are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked, but not combined. We are interested and associated, but not absorbed. And should European statesmen address us in the words which were used of old, shall I speak for thee to the king or the captain of the host? We should reply with the Shunammite woman, nay, sir, for we dwell among our own people. <laughs>